Again, good morning, everyone, and welcome to this event on emerging technology for connectivity, accelerating digital transformation in LDCs, LLDCs, and SIDs. My name is Aminata Garba. I will be moderating this session this morning. Uh, and the program of the day, today we have a theme which is on trends in emerging technology for connectivity and digital transformation. On, on the different sessions we'll have today, we will try to set the scene for the next few days. So we will start with this spotlight session, breaking the break chains, the rise of slow internet. And then we have a session right after on scalable e-government solutions. Then we will have an opening ceremony at 2 p.m. At 3 p.m. we have a session on trends in emerging technology, and then we will have some keynotes on emerging technology at 5.30, especially focusing on the America region. So let's go straight to this session, which is a spotlight session, breaking the break, brand chains, the rise of the slow internet. Um, and in this session, uh, by highlighting the assumptions behind two transformative technologies, the internet and Bitcoin protocols, Pindar Wong will illustrate how surfacing and break, breaking blockchain can accelerate digital transformation in non-obvious ways. Will the internet continue to rot or will new IP or crypt protocol renew it in time or is the internet itself a brain chain? This is what we will explore in this talk. Our speaker today is Mr. Pinda Wong, who is the chairman of Verify, a Hong Kong-based internet financial infrastructure consultancy company. He is an internet pioneer who co-founded the first licensed internet service provider in Hong Kong and leads the Belt and Road Blockchain Consortium. So previously, Pinder also served on the Hong Kong Government Committee on Innovation, Technology, and Industrialization, and he has held many, many other leadership positions. So I will just stop here and then give the floor to Pinder, who will tell us today about Brenchen. Pinder, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Amanata, for this kind introduction, and thank you and apologies for being a few minutes late. Um, as mentioned, we have a very big task of us today, which is to set the scene uh, in some sense for a very eventful week ahead. Um, and why don't we just get stuck in? So what I'm going to do is just talk through, and if I could have the staff advance the slide to the next slide by next, uh, that would be great. Next slide, please. So with this uh, spotlight keynote, I would like to thank... Um, Sorry, Hu Lin Zhao, uh, the Secretary General, obviously the uh, staff and wonderful translators that we have for the week ahead, which will be extremely interesting. Um, could we have the uh, previous slide one up before that? Yeah, and so what I thought we would do is um, in the spotlight uh, is to set the, uh, to think bigger thoughts and, and in some sense to dream bigger dreams, uh, if only to, to help set the tone for what will be um, the, the, uh, the themes for not only today, but for the rest of the week. Next slide, please. Now, what I originally wanted to do was to talk about sort of the, the great big debate over the last three, four years with what uh, technical discussions within the ITU about the new internet protocol uh, as uh, as being promulgated uh, via the ITU and also the quick protocol is in some sense, um, the uh, the internet engineering task force vision uh, as originally proposed by, uh, by, by Google, in fact. Um, and as was mentioned in the keynote, it's not, clear to me that this, this giant tussle uh, is actually symptomatic of the internet itself being disrupted. Uh, as you know, a lot of techniques and industries are now moving on to the internet, and the internet itself was the big disruptor over the last 20 years. But there's some very interesting developments in, for example, the Bitcoin or blockchain protocols, which have a fundamentally different architecture. And it's not clear to me uh, that the future is just a selection between these two protocols, new internet IP or the quick protocol. Uh, in last month's keynote that I gave at the, uh, the AF star, the Afri uh, African Internet Summit, um, there was a comment that actually disturbed me, which was this whole notion of having uh, an embedded assumption uh, in your mind, which you weren't really aware of. And that really is really why I want to talk about brain chains 
today and not uh, really the, the difference between new IP and the quick protocol. So next slide, please. Now, the reason why it disturbed me was obviously when I'm, we were thinking about the internet development in Africa about the last 20 years and the next 20 years, uh, it seems to me that there seems to be the set of assumptions that somehow invisibly limits uh, or confines or restricts the freedom of your thinking. And that was a comment that was made in, in my session, and it really disturbed me. Um, and so today's sort of focus and spotlight is in some sense to try and unpack that. Uh, this 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 brain chain that that was what my term uh, for the for this this phenomenon of in some sense these hidden assumptions. So I'm going to be using two examples: the internet as the first one and Bitcoin protocols as the second to illustrate really um, that we should be very sensitive to these brain chains and surface them as soon as we can. Next slide, please. So as you know, the chain is a series of, of links and to break a brain chain, you're trying to find the weakest link in some sense, the weakest part of the series of, of assumptions. And so today, again, using these two examples, let's try and, and surface what is a brain chain by using some examples and seeing how we can break them. Next slide. So as was mentioned, we have LDCs, LLDCs and SIDs. And to be honest, I wasn't actually sure what these meant. So uh, obviously, I'm trying to go and lead into the poll next, if we can have the next slide. And uh, what I would like to know is, you know, where are you from? What's, what's in a name? You know, for these uh, least developed economies or landlocked developing co countries or, or, or uh, small island uh, developing states, um, if you're from any one of these, you know, choose one, two, or three in the poll. Or if you're from none of them, please uh, choose item number four. So could we run the first poll? Yes, please. I will do it in a minute. I have small issue here. Sorry about that. No problem. And what I'm basically trying to find is, you know, where, where is stopped. everyone? Okay. Thank you. The poll is not quite there. Um, but what I'm trying to figure out is we have 100 or so people on this uh, on this video conference and the whole theme of the week is uh, LDCs, LLDCs and SID, uh, small island developing states. Um, so I want to actually, you know, try and figure out where everyone's from, uh, when we can get the poll running. Uh, okay, so here we should have, where are you from? Well, are you from a least developed country? Are you from a landlocked developing country? Are you from a small island developing state or none of the above? If you could just choose one of those and, and press the submit button Let's just see where everyone is from. And we'll bring the results up once the results come in. The point I'm trying to illustrate, though, is in what's in the name is, you know, do you accept this, this framing? And this framing for LDCs, LLDCs, and SIDs uh, is going to be persistent for the rest of the week. And to me, it was, in some sense, the first uh, example of a potential brain, ch uh, a brain chain primarily because, and I'll go through it um, in, in a moment, there is uh, some, some assumptions with the naming of this that I'm not sure, uh, given my experience with the African Internet Summit, that I entirely agree with uh, both the terminology and all the framing. Next slide, please. And we can show the results from the uh, poll uh, whenever they're ready. We have and the reason why... 54% you have the result? voted. Okay. Well, let's just wait, a, yeah, just wait for a few more minutes. Okay. Um, the reason why I don't accept this is because of some of the words the, that, that sort of trigger me uh, based on last month's discussion of the internet development in Africa. These are the words like small, leased, island, landlocked. I mean, they're implicit in the terms of the definitions, but I would argue um, that we may not necessarily need to use this geographic or size-based framing. Uh, next slide, please. In some sense, I think we should really get rid of it. Um, now, what COVID-19 has taught us is uh, this disease, which has spread globally, has in some sense divided us and conquered us. But at the same time, we have our own way of, uh, of having these so-called lockdowns to also divide and conquer the disease itself. More importantly, uh, next slide, please. The ITU and the way that this conference has been framed is really from obviously the ITU nation state uh, viewpoint. 
the 193, 194 members of the ITU and members of the United Nations, this has an implicit assumption of nation state actors. In other words, if you were to be a member of the ITU, I mean, nation states as a treaty organization, you, you are then obviously welcome and it has been succeeding uh, as a framework for 100, 130 plus years. Uh, the last 20 years though, in terms of the networks, uh, a network like the internet that doesn't see borders, um, there is a, there's a, I think an implicit uh, tension now between the nation state view and I would say the, uh, the global network view. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So COVID-19 talked talk, um, in some sense about the, you know, we can, many of us who, who don't have to go to a factory, we can just work from home. Uh, and in other words, the importance of the network uh, is now uh, paramount, uh, especially in the COVID-19 era. And so, as I said earlier, I'd like to use two examples of trying to surface brain trains um, through two, uh, two, two uh, famous networks. The first is the rise of the stupid network, uh, something that I was involved with uh, in the uh, in the early 1990s, which was actually the rise of the internet itself. Next slide. So here's an example of the uh, the internet as it was in 1973. It's gone from this uh, research network with a minimum small number of nodes to now this uh, massive global network with 80,000 different networks, which will participate to form it. And the current view is through evolution of protocols like Quick or New IP that these net, this network of networks will continue to expand. Next slide. Now, time does not permit me to go into, but I would highly uh, recommend you look at this wonderful essay called The Rise of the Stupid Network by the, an AT&T senior researcher called Dave Eisenberg at the very beginning of the commercialization of the internet. Now, this was from the perspective of the person who was deeply involved with the phone network. Um, an international voice such as uh, IDD, in other words, the domain of the ITU. And in this essay, and this famous essay of the rise of this um, of the stupid network, several of the assumptions of the phone network were in fact put completely upside down. And he basically highlighted that. And I would encourage you to, to read it when, when, you, when you can. Next slide, please. So in the old days, uh, we had this uh, five ESS uh, voice switch uh, the network was very smart, and we used to collect these very dumb black phones to the network. There wasn't any computing power on the edge of the network. It was all inside the core of the network with these very smart um, uh, electronic uh, voice switches. Now, as uh, has been said elsewhere, you know, the Stone Age didn't end because we ran out of stones. Uh, we, in fact, had a, a different kind of architecture, which was completely different, which was not a smart network. In fact, it was a stupid network. Next slide, please. Now, the stupid network was very different. It didn't have any real intelligence in the core of the network. It, in fact, the intelligence was pushed out to the edge of the network. The network itself was, was stupid. It was a dumb network. And the edge devices uh, that connected had all the computing power. And this, in fact, was uh, perfect for the evolution of, uh, and to, uh, of the semiconductor boom over the last 20 odd years and the change of the network uh, uh, attaching methodology. Uh, and that this is the network that we know today. So this is kind of ironic that you would do something which was take the intelligence out of the network, put it to the edge of the network, uh, as in the case of the internet, and this different internet architecture, this different set of assumptions, in fact, changed everything. Next slide. And this, what it changed with the internet is once you take the intelligence out to the edge of the network, you could tinker at the edge and you wouldn't have to, to rip out the core and upgrade the core. And many of the uh, famous internet companies now, the social media companies and the platform companies exploited that. And it was a great period of uh, permissionless innovation, primarily because you didn't have to upgrade the whole network. You could just upgrade the edges and the applications on that as you saw fit. Next slide, please. But the internet is a global network. It's not an international network. And, and what I mean by that, I want to go through, because this is, again, in some sense, the first um, uh, brain train. If you can just think about why, what is different between what, what is a global network and what is an uh, international network. Next slide. And the key thing here is to notice that you're not, we're not talking between nations, between nation state actors. 
Uh, so uh, obviously the ITU is, is, is framed in those terms, and that's one of my chief concerns today is, again, moving away from this international only viewpoint, but yet a network that is still global. Next slide, please. And so if we just look at this change in worldview, this change of world from just only having nation state actors and, and the genesis of uh, where this uh, Westphalian view came from, which was uh, in the, the, the 30 years of war from 1648, this seems to be an implicit assumption, at least that's worked very well um, for the last uh, few hundred years. Uh, but then the internet is a global network, but doesn't rely uh, explicitly on nation state actors. Next, next slide, please. So what the internet taught us was that um, geography uh, is forever, in a sense. Uh, you can't divorce your neighbors. Countries are next to each other. But when we have the internet, everyone now is your, your neighbor. Uh, and that changes, in some sense, what, how we, we view things. Next slide, please. And the potential, as we know from the headlines with uh, internet ransomware and uh, hacking and hacking incidents and security incidents, that now when everyone is potentially your neighbor on the internet, uh, we also have the uh, downside that potentially everywhere is a bad neighborhood. Next slide, please. Now, Jeff Houston is no stranger to the ITU. And there are two papers, again, as part of the homework exercise that I would encourage you to read. And that is some, some concern, and I share Jeff's concern, that the internet as we know it today is uh, potentially failing. So here's one view. And if we go to the next slide, please. Here's another one, that the internet is actually rotting. And this is by a Harvard professor. Uh, we don't have time to go into that, but there is some concern right now. The internet itself is not that there's a question mark over the internet, that you know, in some sense to connect to the internet, given all the security issues, there is no, there is a, a careful calculation that needs to be made. It's no longer that connecting to the internet is good. Uh, connecting to the internet may actually have quite a big downside. And that leaves the opportunity for considering other, other forms. Next slide, please. Uh, we can also see that the, the network itself has evolved to be uh, a very, very uh, uh, um, surveilled network. And we have these social platforms that does all the surveillance. This was, again, not necessarily a, a foreseen uh, 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 forecast, but that is the way things have evolved. Um, so what I want to do, I think we're, we're running a little bit out of, of time, is really to get to the, the crux of the matter. So I want to skip forward um, uh, to the slides. Actually, let's leave the slides as they are here. Um, Actually, the next slide is, is good, which is, you know, with the nation state view, we have this rule of rule of law within nation states. Uh, we also have this chief problem, which we've been dealing with with internet governance for the last 20 years, which is all laws have borders. Um, so the examples of brain chains uh, to, to, uh, to go through and to highlight was that the internet, there was a fundamental assumption, and that assumption was distance equals cost. Uh, and old networks such as the International Direct Dial Network um, had uh, the accounting rate settlement uh, assumption. And with that, that governed the world of the telephone network. When we have a different architecture, like the internet architecture, where distance did not equal cost, if you understood that that was the first chain uh, that you didn't have to, you know, that you could break, that distance did not equal cost, then you would have made them a lot of money out of the internet era. There are other examples as we wrap up in the next few minutes. The second one is, in some sense, the Bitcoin protocol. The Bitcoin protocol um, is uh, not a, it's not uh, only, it doesn't only run on this uh, stupid network, the internet. It coordinates every 10 minutes um, with these blocks that are produced. So it's a very slow network. And so the irony here is when you have something that's both stupid and slow, that's not normally as a recipe for success but it does lead to some very, very interesting properties. And in the later slides, which you can go through after the call, I would go through two examples of this slow network. The slow network itself, where you have, in some sense, the assumption here is that uh, time is money, uh, and Bitcoin is an example of that data equals money. But more importantly, that by relaxing some of the constraints um, of uh, decentralized systems, uh, we can have massive replication. 
from not just replicating a few uh, tens of nodes, but on the Bitcoin network, for example, uh, about 100,000 nodes. So the summary here is that the, develop the small island that, that I see, or the landlocked island that I see, is in fact between my ears. Um, what I mean by that is, I think there is a third way. I think there is a, not necessarily a, a, a binary choice between new IP or the quick protocols. I think if you accept these terms of being least developed or small island or landlocked, um, it doesn't really resonate with the challenges ahead, which is the opportunity to lead. And so what I would like to encourage us all uh, is listen very carefully over the next few days about the, the developments in space and development of 5G, um, the development in decentralized identifiers, and try to surface what are the hidden assumptions? What are the brain chains, if any? Because I think the, the risk here is to accept, accept the discussions as presented, and they not necessarily may be relevant to your local context. Thank you very much. Please let me show the polls, the, res the mm. results. We have 81% uh, who voted. Let's see who, and where everyone is from. Right. right, wonderful. So many were from, again, you know, if you accept this definition of, of least developed country uh, or developing country, then again, that is, uh, well, actually most people are actually from none of the above. So that's, that's pretty good if you accept that. So what I would encourage you is to reach out over email. Please do share the slides after this, pretty self-explanatory. But uh, the point here is if there are any chains of assumptions, let's surface those as soon as possible because accepting the argument as given is probably the biggest mistake you can make. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Pinda, for this uh, presentation. We are running out of time, but uh, maybe I can allow one question if we do have in the audience quickly before handing to the next uh, moderator. Uh, otherwise, the slides are uploaded on the website already, so you can download them. Uh, and then they are shared in the chat here. I will now, because I don't see any hand, I will, I will hand over to the next uh, uh, session. We are late a little bit. I apologize to the moderator. Uh, so I will hand over to Mr. Sherman Hong, who is Senior Advisor, Digital Impact Alliance for the next session, which is entitled Scalable E-Government Solutions for Developing Countries for Thank you so much. And then after this session, we will have a session at 2 p.m., which is the opening ceremony. I welcome you all for these sessions. Thank you, Pinda, again. Uh, and then if we have any other questions in the chat, I will be sure to forward them to you. Bye. So Sherman, the floor is yours. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to pass to the head of the European office at ITU, Mr. Gerlstorff, under for the opening. Thank you very much, Sherman, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this is a great uh, starting of the week uh, with this event. Um, so good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on the part of the world uh, you are connecting from. Uh, I'm pleased uh, to welcome you at this special session on the scalable e-government solutions for developing countries uh, that is held within the framework of uh, this emerging technology uh, for connectivity a special event. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, digital government services are vital for developing and um, uh, a digital economy and that benefits all citizens by expanding access to critical services such as health, education and social protection. Countries uh, are seeking to achieve the SDGs uh, in the next 10 years uh, and they are increasingly looking uh, to national digital strategies and agendas to transform the way they do the business and improve the lives of the citizens. More importantly, however, uh, they are looking towards the concrete solutions uh, solutions that may address their needs. And uh, the example of the GovStack uh, is one of them. So that's why welcome to this special uh, session which will provide more detail uh, on this offering. 
This has never been more true uh, during the times of the COVID-19, um, putting several con constraints to the traditional offline uh, government services. Therefore, there is a need to act, uh, particularly in LDCs, LLDCs and uh, SEEDs that face challenges in terms of infrastructure and the capacity to implement uh, such uh, services. ITU estimates that uh, 430 billion US dollars are needed uh, over the next 10 years uh, to bridge the gap and to get everyone in the world connected. Uh, and we have still over 3.7 billion people offline. A part of um, and this much needed investment uh, must be aimed at engaging citizens online and offer meaningful ways to connect and benefit of the government um, uh, services. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, the GovStack initiative seeks to tackle the barriers and to implementation and scale up of government services uh, within the countries. Uh, current challenges uh, to digital government include lack of coordination and the habit of working in silos, uh, funding um, constraints, absence of scalable solutions, uh, all uh, posing significant constraints uh, to digital uh, transformation in uh, government, increasing cost and inefficiency uh, and uh, often leading uh, to uh, inaction. A whole-of-government platform approach uh, to developing government services uh, through the reuse and minimal customization of quick and easy-to-adapt building blocks uh, is at the heart of the success of digital government services projects. Open source models for the government uh, platform uh, that is built uh, from modular and reusable uh, components, leveraging a secure and standards-based approach uh, are an optimal solution uh, to solve these issues in a cost efficient and scalable manner. Uh, this is what we consider uh, as an emerging technology and emerging new paradigm, uh, which many um, best practices across the world uh, that can be replicated in developing countries as well LDCs, LLDs, uh, DCs, and uh, CEDs. Ladies and gentlemen, to today uh, you will hear more about this initiative and the concrete next steps uh, that are on the horizon. I'm very pleased to recognize that the partnership forged by two countries in Europe, Estonia and Germany, which have joined the forces uh, with the uh, Digital Impact Alliance and ITU in October last year to bring this project to life. As we proceed towards the implementation over the next two, three years, uh, we can expect a significant impact uh, for beneficiary countries. And the outcomes of today's discussions will be an important step forwards and uh, towards this goal. Uh, let me also remind that this initiative has also uh, been originated by European countries within the framework of the um, working um, as part of the Europe for Europe. Uh, approach, as well as Europe for the other regions. This is a significant contribution to our ITU regional initiative for Europe, uh, focusing on the um, citizen-centric approach to build services uh, for national administrations that seeks to facilitate the development of transformative and paperless citizen-centric uh, services that are accessible and available to all members of society. Ladies and gentlemen, before I conclude, let me thank Estonia Minister of Foreign Affairs, German Federal Ministry of Economic Cooperation and Development, and the Digital Impact Alliance for the work carried out so far and for continuous support to this initiative. Let me also thank the European Commission that is uh, taking a closer look and uh, as potential for scaling up GovStack across the world. ITU stands ready to contribute and support this uh, important process. With that said, um, uh, would I like to thank um, once again and to all those who are with us today and wish you a great session and the event throughout the week. Without further ado, I would like to uh, introduce our distinguished speakers, including uh, Mr. Sherman uh, Kong, Senior Advisor at the Digital Impact Alliance and the UN, at the UN Foundation, who will be moderator of this session. I have also a great pleasure uh, to introduce uh, my colleague Hani Eskandar, Senior Advisor, Digital Services 
um, tele at the Telecommunication Development Bureau of the ITU, Sarah and Teresa Fischer, consultant at the Deutsche Gesellschaft für Internationale Zusammenarbeit and GIZ uh, of Germany, as well as Martin Cavett, uh, National Digital Advisor of the Government Office of Estonia. This session uh, will take a look at the following proceeding. We'll introduce, produce, we'll provide uh, the brief introductions and opening statements by the speakers. We'll have the panel discussion and we'll, as well as uh, we'll have more interactive parts with the polls and Q&As. But without further ado, let me hand over to Sherman um, Kong um, to chair this session. And before doing so, I would like to also invite our um, IT moderator to provide a few announcements and that we know how to proceed uh, with the session. Thank you. Hello, thank you so much. Just a second. Dear participants, thank you for joining. Before starting, okay, we don't see me. We don't see me. <laughs> we. Okay, here we go. Uh, dear participant, thank you for joining. Before starting the meeting, I would like to give you some instructions on the Zoom platform and the meeting itself. This meeting is entirely remote. The audience is kindly asked to keep their camera and microphone switched off to minimize bandwidth apart from where taking the floor. Please rename yourselves and add the represented member state, sector member or academia before your name. To do so, please right click on your name in the list of participants. The moderator of each session will recognize the speakers and will give you the floor when the turn comes. Everybody inv are invited to use, okay, to use the chat for any questions or comments. Moderators will be monitoring and any comment may be read out if time allows. You can view and activate the captioning by clicking on live transcript at the bottom bar of the Zoom interface. The meeting also benefits of six UN languages interpretation. Please select your preferred language from the bottom bar of the Zoom interface. Dear participants, please note that uh, when using headphones with Bluetooth, interpre interpreters are not able to hear properly. Kindly use headset headsets with USB connection. The meeting is being recorded and the recording will be used for report writing and communication purposes. Every effort is being made to facilitate the smooth flow of this meeting. Thank you for your cooperation and I wish you a good meeting. Is that, is that a cue for me to intervene now? Uh, okay, hello everybody. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, member state delegations and other ministerial officials, partners, colleagues and friends. As Yaroslav introduced, we are wanting to talking about scalability in e-government solutions for countries, especially in your context, and, uh, and a newly established partnership across the four agencies that are represented by the speakers here today. This is a and kind of an you know in in the context of the emerging theme of this week, we would like to introduce. Uh, basically a, a practice or a model that we have been observed in advanced digital governance contexts, and we want to introduce this concept to you and the work that we're embarking on um, since the end of 2020, and how we would like uh, for you all to engage and to see that there is um, continued effort and technical support provided to member states represented here today in the audience. Next, please. Next, please. So what we have been noticing in terms of countries that have been recognized for advanced digital governance is this kind of model that's been converging and, and we've seen this uh, in our review and in discussions with countries. And it's recognizing government 
as a singular platform for citizens. And you might have seen this diagram in literatures, in other contexts, and in other debates or discussions. Uh, it might vary, but the notion behind it is, is that there is a shared digital service infrastructure in place that is facilitated uh, and, and operated by government in a more cross-sectoral whole of government approach um, manner. Uh, and however you divide it, there are some fundamental elements that we've seen that leading countries are practicing. So it's around developing and, and maintaining and operating these foundational elements within the infrastructural context of digital government services. So in some countries you see uh, generic components being stood up that can facilitate services and needs across different agencies and as well as um, other government uh, branches at large. Um, such as digital ID, authentication, seen cases of unified payment interfaces or, or, um, or uh, 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 gateways, and then common applications that are built on top of it, uh, contextualized for different agency needs. So it moves away from the traditional sense of disparate solutions that has been deployed by different agencies or as siloed or limited by um, you know, lack of uh, funding or, or lack of demands or needs. And it moves towards a more centralized shared approach where agencies describe and, and express digital needs that are common across and to aggregate and to build together in this more centralized way. Next, please. And you've seen cases like this and you will hear today, very fortunately, a representation from Estonia in terms of how they've done uh, this, this, this kind of uh, work or approach. Uh, but in a sense, there are some illustrative examples uh, that we have seen in the context of Estonia or, uh, or, or in other countries as well. This, is, this happens geographically very um, variant across the variants of uh, geographic uh, boundaries uh, of countries recognizing or government recognizing these generic components that needs to be deployed in order to facilitate uh, sectoral needs, but using a more shared approach. So in, in the case of Estonia, you see this notion of building blocks around a singular identity, uh, interoperable service layers that can connect different components or, or agency um, uh, uh, in a context or, or, or blocks, so to speak, um, and some other uh, digital components that underlie um, the, the, the digital government service infrastructure itself. Next. And similarly to the case of India, we've, we've, seen, we've heard of the success of the digital ID there around Adhar and moving towards the notion of this India stack, where there's the digital ID component in place connected with other gen generic digital building blocks uh, around unified payment schemes, around uh, e-signatures and so on that um, help to build this fundamental um, working layer where then you have different sectoral services that are built on top of it and this fully facilitates a lot of um, uh, uh, digital government needs and it makes for uh, easier scalability. And in, in the case of India, especially looking into the financial inclusion context that this had really kind of accelerate the deli delivery of services in that regard. Um, and you can see that there's uh, a list of generic building block elements that are kind of enshrined in the agile India enterprise architectural approach in the government documents itself. Next. And lastly, a case of Singapore as well, and they've also kind of emulate the stack approach where there are fundamental generic layers um, that are built underneath which services different uh, sectoral components and, and, and connecting with, uh, with citizens in more of a you know, one government or one platform approach. 
Next. So across the, these different leading examples, we've empirically abstract what are the core elements that are technologically informing the design of this. And this is really, uh, as you have seen the term already, uh, a generic reusable sets of building blocks that uh, form this underlying layer where the different high impact use cases can be built on top and multiple SDGs can rapidly be um, effectively uh, impacted or delivered. And it, it leads to more efficient scalability, it leads to more uh, cost optimization as well, as you will see in a few minutes. Next. And so we, in, in this partnership that Yaroslav mentioned, uh, uh, labeled GovStack, we've started to look into these fundamental building blocks, if you will, that forms this underlying general digital services platform. And the characteristics of them are that they are reusable, that they are cross-sectoral, that they serve fundamental um, uh, generic processes. Uh, there is no kind of a sectoral uh, only focus in this, because if you look on the right, uh, a library of building block sets we have identified so far, payments, identity, security, information, mediation, and all the other components that we have identified and in, in leading country examples in terms of digital governance, these are fundamental comp blocks that they, um, that they develop and maintain. And I mean, yeah, in combination, yeah. facilitate the, the, the delivery of services much more rapidly. Next. And it's, I mentioned, there are, there's, it's not just good practice in terms of efficiency and scalability in the context of what we're talking about today in terms of scalable e government solutions, but it's, has good business sense as well, because we have seen real dem demonstrable economic values or, or cost savings that um, countries have enjoyed. Uh, we've seen research done by GSMA on the case of India or Australia, where, is, where there is tangible cost saving in terms of um, providing shared infrastructures to, to different agency services um, and real economic values. If, there is a more whole of government approach in terms of providing digital services and cost, of, cost optimization as well in, in our discussions with Saudi Arabia. So both in terms of uh, providing shared services in order to optimize costs or in terms of facilitating a faster delivery of services in order to generate real economic growth has been observed by our studies as well so far. Next. So then touching on the initiative that, um, that has been introduced in the beginning. Uh, next. What GovSteg really is aiming to do as a, as a partnership and as an initiative is really to help empirically abstract and demystify these kinds of approaches. We've seen commonalities across the cases of Estonia, India, Singapore, and so on, on what kind of generic digital components that they're focused on developing as, the, as part of the foundational elements or core engine that drives digital government services. So what we as a partnership or initiative aims to, aims to do is really to unpack this technical um, approach and make the case for uh, more reusable, comprehensible references for uh, countries in, in represented by audience today, as well as other advanced member states to model against, to learn from this, and to be able to um, start moving their digital government service portfolios towards an approach like this so that they can also accelerate their own e-government e services or e-government um, uh, implementations. So the model itself is really uh, an, an, an extrapolation of what has proven to have worked already in countries 
And this is something that we have observed as an emerging trend that uh, advanced digital government states have converged towards. Um, and as a little bit of background, ITU and the Digital Impact Alliance had worked on this initial a, a, and published uh, a logical model behind this uh, called the SDG Digital Investment Framework. So the GovStack initiative really is an extension of informing the, the um, technical notions behind this. And you will see uh, one of the outputs that we're looking, aiming to um, achieve is uh, really informing the technical design of, of these building block components that I've touched on earlier. So as I mentioned, it was brought on by four founding partners, ITU, Dial, and the government of Germany and Estonia as well. Uh, and we aim to work on this in a, you know, in, in a very collaborative manner and with that, next, I would like to kind of call on the different agencies represented by the speaking panel here today now to talk about their rationalization motivation behind why we are part of this government uh, GovStack initiative, as well as, you know, taking a step back on some of the challenges and opportunities and leading examples in terms of how e-governance solutions have been scaled. And so to that extent, I like to kind of frame our opening statements around the th three key themes here. So I would like to first call on uh, IT representative, Mr. Hani Iskander around how we uh, want, how we aim to accelerate national digital government services in the context of uh, a model as such. Hani, look for sure. Okay, thanks very much, Sherman, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Um, actually, just to build on what uh, Sherman has been saying uh, about ITU uh, interest to be part of, uh, of this initiative is really uh, dated back to many years where we've been seeing uh, continuous increasing in demand in terms of digitalization. And uh, I think this has been even accelerated recently by the push from COVID where it, it, it's becoming evident that uh, digitalization is very uh, essential to- uh, But uh, jo uh, Julian is on, uh, on. Uh, Which really proved that digitalization is, uh, is essential to you know, ensure business continuity. Now with this increased demand on uh, digitalization, there will be also increased investments. And um, uh, if those investments are not well managed, um, this can lead indeed to, uh, to uh, increasing the, the difficulty to manage your digital resources and digital assets, because this is what we have seen previously that, that there is a lot, a lot of uh, duplication, a lot of uh, fragmentation, a lot of siloing. So we felt that, um, you know, we need to uh, adopt um, business as usual cannot continue and we need to adopt a slightly different approach in terms of managing this investment. And that's why a few years back, indeed, the ITU work was dialed to, you know, think through um, how can we have uh, an approach to make a digital investment that uh, can be done once, but serve so many different sectors and so many different use cases. And this will have huge implication in terms of, uh, you know, increasing uh, the efficiency, um, improving cost efficiency, but also um, accelerating and increasing the speed of delivering new services. And this is the basis for which we have developed this um, uh, SDG digital investment framework, which is really based on a number of uh, the concept of reusable building blocks. Now, uh, from ITU perspective, uh, it's extremely important now that um, we uh, work with countries on how they can adopt what you can call those types of architectural approaches and, um, and how they can uh, really put in place what you can consider as a digi digital public infrastructure. Actually, this uh, concept, digital public infrastructure, is, uh, is an emerging uh, concept, and, um, and, and I think that's why we are you know, bringing it to the emerging technology week. Um, it's it's been now used uh, by so many different organizations, 
to um, uh, explain a little bit that while we usually tended to think of infrastructure in terms of connectivity, in terms of you know cables and internet and and all of that. Uh, when you look at the service layer, there is also the concept of what you can call a digital service infrastructure, meaning that uh, there are some components, there are some capabilities, there are, there are some shared services that are, they need to be so ubiquitous, so present, they can sit on top of internet and they are available to all, to hold the government. And uh, as, as mentioned, this can have huge implication um, for rich countries, uh, you know, like uh, like you know, European countries and and uh, some of the Asian countries, but also if you look at it from the LDC and SIDS perspective, you cannot by no means afford to have these types of duplication, which is happening so far. So this concept of uh, digital public infrastructure, this service kind of uh, platform. Um, uh, is uh, is uh, not an option anymore, and uh, and you cannot adopt the business as usual. From the ITU perspective, we are really focusing now on building country capacities so that countries can, on their own, lead this establishment of these types of infrastructure, and really um, uh, being able to. Uh, you know, make those investments and make some good decisions in terms of investments uh, and put in place those types of foundations that will enable uh, reusability, but also interoperability and uh, they are secure by design uh, and uh, they can really accelerate the whole digitalization. So we looked at it from uh, an ITU perspective in terms of how we facilitate and bridge this knowledge transfer. Countries are looking, you know, to some of the countries uh, like like India, like Singapore, like Estonia, like so many other countries who have gone very far in terms of digitalization and um, and really looking on how they can start from where the other ended actually, instead of you know repeating the same mistakes and reinventing the wheel. And and really the objective of this joint initiative, uh, which we call GAPSTEC, is really to bridge this knowledge gap is to say, how can we make available some, what you can call digital public goods, meaning uh, how can we make some digital resources um, uh, available and open and accessible to everyone on how you can go about building your uh, digital government platform and put in place these types of foundations that we are talking about. Uh, of course, we all know that, you know, there are different approaches for capacity development, uh, you know, like the classical traditional training, um, whether it's remote or face-to-face, -face, et cetera. And we all know that while this is extremely important, it's not enough. And you need to go one or two or even three steps ahead in really in order to bridge this gap. So one of the things is that we have adopted, and uh, this is why ITU is, is really part of this, is to say, uh, let's let's adopt a different type of approaches by learning by doing and learning by example. So in that sense, this is how we uh, approach it, is to say, uh, let's try to provide a, a digital public good, meaning an open uh, digital government platform that is implemented as a model or as an example, or you can call it a reference implementation or of a digital government platform. You can think about it more or less as a mini you know, digital government platform of Estonia or, or, or India or, or other types of countries and how you can apply all the principles and concepts uh, of standard-based approaches, secure by design, protecting privacy, ensuring the citizen, you know, consent, uh, enabling interoperability, how you create, use open APIs, how you adopt you know, all the new trends in, in scaling up digital services like adopting microservices, et cetera. So that there are a lot of things that we would like to bring and make available as a demo platform where countries can come and learn and, and play with it and learn and experiment and even build, you know, services on top of it uh, um, and see how, how those types of principles could be implemented in, in reality. So the way we approach that is to say, okay, Let's make available those new digital public goods, DPGs. Um, let's really uh, make sure that the 
model platform or the you know example platform is really built based on best practices from a number of uh, countries and and we use this as as a resource for knowledge transfer and making sure that we give more and more ownership for governments to see themselves and can implement similar types of platforms uh, in their own countries so the whole idea is that this type of you know open accessible uh, resources will help countries first of all of course to learn but also potentially to replicate this in a way or another in their countries um, and how can this also can inform procurement processes because we all know that procurement is is something that um, uh, is always a challenge uh, in order how you can you know procure uh, you know those types of solutions uh, that goes beyond the one specific solution scope or beyond even one department or one agency and you make you know these types of whole of government type of you know infrastructure available so we do hope that those types of uh, you know dpgs digital public goods will really accelerate this process of knowledge transfer and give more ownership and give you know um, the leadership for countries so that they can take ownership and really lead the development of their own uh, digital foundation and really enable uh, their governments to be forward looking and they, to be ready uh, you know for the future thank you thank you Hani. as as Hani rightfully mentioned this is really to support country capacity and one way that we're trying to do so in terms of the partnership we've established here today is really to align others around the notion that this could be a way forward and it requires not only us developing these kinds of references and, and help inform the model but it also requires uh, a level of ecosystem alignment so in terms of building uh, partnerships for others to come along the ride I would like to now invite uh, Sarah Fisher from GIZ for her opening statement. Excuse me, I didn't hear, hear you, sorry. Dear Mr. Iskander, can you repeat the, the, the last phrase? Oh, you're waiting for the presentation, right? Yeah, yeah sorry, I think we need to unmute Sarah. Uh, okay, she's yeah, on mute. Right now. I, think it should be, I should be working all right. Sorry, I couldn't unmute myself because <laughs> I think that needs to be done by the host, but I'm uh, hopeful that everyone can hear me now. Perfect. Thank you very much, uh, Sherman. Um, and also let me start by saying it's a great honor to join today's panel on scalable e-government solutions alongside our partners in crime here from the GovStack Initiative, Sherman Honey, Martin Yaroslav. Um, I'm happy to be here. And I can just say from um, GIZ side, from um, the German development side, um, digitization or the digital transformation has become a key priority over the last years, because we really see it as a useful tool and helpful tool to address global challenges, to promote sustainable development, and thus hopefully you know, create better access um, to services and solutions for all of us. And as Sherman and also Hani pointed out, I think especially the last year and COVID has shown, at, shown us yet again what tremendous role digital technologies can play not only in fighting a global pandemic in the end, but also in keeping communication flowing and keeping services accessible. And really, I guess, have we been made so aware of how much our fate also depends on science, on digital innovation, as uh, we have been in the last year. And uh, since the 
start of the pandemic, we also have been or have faced an increased demand from our partner countries to support on um, national digital transformation, on strategies, but also on responsible use of data, for example. And I think um, countries across the globe have recognized the, the significant potential that um, digitization holds for, uh, yeah, to weather the disruptions that the pandemic hold and brought, but also to um, inform and to better build government services and infrastructures and thereby keep access for um, citizens open in that sense. And what we see at the moment is that numerous citizen services and public administration processes such as say contract awards, patient files, agricultural market systems, but also building of health systems, cause an enormous volume of administrative IT work. And in order for these processes to work also more smoothly, I think we highly depend on reliant IT systems, on reliant solutions to process this kind of information also in an efficient manner. And I think this is where the GovStack collaboration and the GovStack initiative will truly power digital transformation and give governments a good chance to build and deploy digital services and applications in a more cost efficient and accelerated and um, most also integrated manner. And the GovStack approach, or also what we call ICT building blocks, digital building blocks, um, thereby can definitely help governments to easily create their own digital platforms and systems and beginning to sketch out for building blocks at the moment, such as payment or ID. Sherman also gave a bit of an overview earlier on um, what concrete building blocks we're engaging in, but I think there is a great progress being made at the moment, and um, I think this is a great, um, great initiative to contribute to not only to the smart development goals as well in the end, but also to make government actions more transparent, more participatory, and offer citizens really the administrative services that they need in their local context. Um, over the last years, we also witnessed um, that more and more donors, as Hani pointed out as well, support the development of digital infrastructure. There is a growing interest in investing in, um, in this field. But we also see that these investments are still often duplicated, they're fragmented, and thereby they're not really often scalable or sustainable in the end. And I think this is also where we see a great chance at the moment um, to align efforts. I think it's a great time to re rethink a little bit also the, the funding structures behind digital public infrastructures to align efforts and to work jointly on this very ambitious agenda um, for international cooperation on good digital public infrastructures, because this is also the time where we kind of can decide and influence what kind of um, digital public goods we're going to build and to make them good, meaning also secure and as resilient as possible. Um, yeah, I think that has been mentioned as well already, but we often operate when it comes to also investment into digital public goods still in silos, so in different sectors. And um, especially now, it's really important to address these parts of digitalization jointly because there are overarching mechanisms that can be used also in different sectors and thereby also give us the chance to basically maximize the return of invest also when it comes to that. And I'm pretty sure that better coordinating investments in DPIs and DPGs really gives us an opportunity, opportunity to overcome these silos. Um, there has been major interest and a great a lot of work also done by, by other partners in this field, for example, also Melinda Gates Foundation, who are also um, gathering around the similar effort. Um, there is a group of um, donors also at the moment establishing or discussing the idea of establishing a global fund to support go partner governments, um, talking also about Gates, not about K um, KFW. So there is a lot going on at the moment. There are a lot of discussions, and I think we're at a crucial point at the moment to align donors' perspectives a little bit more. Um, around digital public goods as well. And I think not only COVID showed us now that 
um, yeah, it's important for us to collaborate on this manner. It's important for us to cooperate on developing good um, digital government solutions that help us in the end also um, build build solutions um, that are inclusive, that are secure, that also protect privacy, and in the end also support human rights when it comes to that. And yeah, we are very happy to be um, part of the GovStack initiative, I can say, from the German side. Um, I think it's great um, to further develop this global community um, that we already started. And I also warmly invite everyone to, to join us on this journey. I think we're always welcoming technical expertise in our working groups. Um, and yeah, we really want to make this also a global approach. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm glad to be here today and uh, thank you so far. <laughs> Back to Sherman, I guess. Thank you, Sarah. I, th I think what other donors are realizing as well is we are really providing a generic model where collaboration and alignment can happen. So in the context of what Sarah mentioned, the GovStack model itself, where what we're trying to extrapolate from successful leading country examples is that it's not really uh, you know, favoring or exclusively looking at one specific sectoral needs or one specific kind of sets of products or goods available but also uh, a more generic uh, approach or framework where uh, there's an understanding that these building blocks or foundational pieces um, tie into the uh, scalability of uh, a more national focused digital government strategy in, in countries we've seen. And certainly we would like to see or support or assist um, uh, LDCs, LDCs and SIDs in this regard as well. So going back to Hani's uh, perspective a little bit in terms of, uh, you know, accelerating country capacity and knowledge transfer, one very good way to do this is to connect to countries and other ministries and uh, government examples that have done this. So we're very pleased to have the representation from Estonia, Mr. Martin uh, uh, Kayev, uh, to speak about this from an Estonian uh, experience perspective of how their um, journey was. So, the Martin, the falls floor is your on your opening statement. So, I hope you can hear me. I've had some a bit of a technical uh, difficulties, but uh, basically, yes. Uh, for Estonia, we realized something like five, four years ago, that our own current governance architecture is not adaptable enough. So one of those reasons of uh, taking a whole of government and the building block approach is about building adaptiveness within government. So uh, the reason for this is that the problem that we are trying to solve with the building blocks and, and with the whole of government approach is actually not a technological problem. Uh, digital government and, and digital transition is always more about the change in mindset and culture, starting from the public sector. So uh, in the Estonian story of uh, starting to build a digital society in 2000, in the end of 90s, basically, one of the core lessons learned is that uh, in order to change the mindset and culture within a society and we, within a public sector context in specific, uh, it's smart to change the tools people use on an everyday basis. And one of those issues, I think, not only in Estonia, but in many other governments as well, is the uh, reason of building monolithic architecture building this huge monster of pieces of infrastructure that are really hard to change and adapt. And, and as we also got stuck in legacy uh, in, in certain parts and uh, certain services, then we realized that it's, it's wiser and smarter to do this domain-driven microservice approach, 
which basically allows enough adaptability. But again, having the lesson learned from Estonia, knowing that uh, uh, the tools we use change the way we think, then our goal in, in piloting and testing these microservices is actually much longer than just technological. It's more about the organizational culture around it and how can we build adaptive organizational governance architecture in one government. But one of those tricks that we also see is that uh, in Estonia, we actually kind of feel that we have already solved the easy questions in, when we regards to digital transformation, uh, meaning that, yes, we have a strong working digital identity, we have a secure data exchange layer, we have data integrity all across the ecosystems, so the problems and challenges that we face are basically much harder to solve than some of these very basic components. But in order to solve these much harder problems, then we also have realized that, well, we are still a very, very small country and, 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 and the future of government services are cross-border. So basically, it's uh, uh, very important to try to do these things in a collaborative way across the borders because um, this GovStack or the microservices approach only starts to work when there is enough community of developers around it, enough of the different public sector governments, entities, authorities that actually utilize and use this toolbox then uh, basically from Estonia's perspective, GovStack is essential to build our own digital government uh, advanced in an advanced way as well. But in order to do that, we need to do it collaboratively because otherwise we, well, we couldn't reach the critical mass of those participating countries, the, the developers and so on. But this kind of uh, ambition only works at scale. So that's why we are like really, really happy uh, to work together with uh, uh, Germany Dial and ITU on these building blocks, uh, because uh, it's not only about the low resource and middle resource settings, but it's also about the digitally advanced countries, because I'm, I'm pretty sure that many of the different governments that are considered to be somewhat advanced uh, in, in digital uh, tools, then many of them are actually thinking about the same lines. Uh, we may talk about Singapore or Australia or New Zealand or, or many other governments or Finland that, uh, that are deploying their whole of government approach based on microservices. But we also need to acknowledge that this is a road that takes a long time and uh, and it's more about building trust within a community so that uh, all of these different kind of microservices uh, and and uh, the collaborations around the different domains may it be healthcare or 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 social welfare or unconsensual uh, uh, cash transfer or any of the other things could imagine uh, could could be uh, implemented and deployed and then of course uh, one other key aspect uh, why estonia is very very uh, invested in this effort is that uh, fundamentally the next 10 to 15 years about building government services is much more about the cross border efforts so, for example, in Estonia, we have managed, well, we haven't st st stood in a line of a, of a DMV or, a, or a, to register a car or something like that. We can do all of those things online for already 10 years. But if we could do those things for other countries as well, like in other countries, then this would significantly boost the economy and, and make our lives better. So the future is on cross-border interoperability. Is, is still the key here, and in order to achieve those things, 
we need to build trust between different stakeholders and, and GovStack is definitely a very, very good example of, of putting these different bits and pieces together and finding a common language and APIs that all of these different applications could could potentially talk to each other and, uh, and, and build trust step by step, starting from the small, uh, easy use cases and then collaboratively uh, evolve into much bigger and difficult ones. So I hope uh, my message was heard, meaning that there were not no, no big technical difficulties, but uh, back to you, Sherman, basically. Thank you, Martin. Uh, good, to, good to finally to have you uh, to join. I know there's some video trouble from, from your end, so apologize on behalf of Estonia for the audience. Usually we see Martins walking around and this kind of, you know, connects to the notion that we have this REITs theme in terms of connectivity. Estonia has a great example. If we meet Martin, those we know Martin, he can, he can basically connect and speak from anywhere. He's probably in the woods somewhere right now. So thank you for having the time and, and the connectivity to join us today. So I think I would like to bring back um, all the speakers now uh, onto the same stage virtually, so to speak, and just have an interactive engagement um, and, and just to get your, get your perspectives and views a little bit more. Um, maybe starting with the questions, going back in terms of uh, accelerating and supporting country capacity, what has been really observable in terms of traditional challenges, uh, you know, uh, uh, each of us have seen in digital government, uh, where uh, countries are trying to engage in terms or, or, or move towards that path of digitalization of government services, but there are some challenges and, and barriers in terms of addressing it in a real scalable manner in the context of scalability that we are here talking about today. So um, it is, you know, so what are some really core challenges that you have observed so far? So maybe from Hani, from ITU's perspective, uh, as you know, having the vantage point of all the member states uh, and, and, and seeing the the incoming needs and requests, uh, what can you share with us? Thanks, Chairman. Uh, yeah, I think there are some commonalities in terms of the type of challenges that uh, many, many countries are facing, and uh, probably they are known by now. But I think it's important to kind of uh, revisit them just to understand what is the problem that we are trying to solve. Um, and this is, you can see, I mean, yourself, when you go to any government, uh, you know, uh, department to get a service, uh, you will see that, um, you know, each government agency is trying to build their own systems. Um, and, uh, and uh, you know, the systems are, of course, they are very different. And, of course, it's very difficult to kind of make sure that uh, data can move from one department to the other which ends up by having a very difficult type of experience for the end user because in many cases, the, they need to go to more than one department uh, and more than uh, one agency to get a service from end to end. Um, the, the problem of having you know, uncoordinated investments is, is not by any mean a trivial problem. Uh, from one side, it has implication indeed on having a kind of a let's say non, not optimum user experience, but also it has huge implication in terms of the ability to scale and the ability to mainstream digitalization in all different services. There are hundreds and hundreds of digital services that needs to be uh, digitized in a government. And there is no way that to digitize each service, you have to build this service from scratch. Um, the way the investments are happening now as Martin was saying, is by developing this, what you can call a monolithic type of application. By monolithic, we mean that it's a, like a big chunk of code. It's a, like a big system where everything is bundled in the system and there is no way to reuse small parts or small capabilities or even to access the data that is kind of captured within this application. So that's why, I mean, you have, then, then each agency has to duplicate its own 
uh, you know, investment. And then there is, of course, no consistency. So each agency have a slightly different approach of doing things. And then it, it, it wastes a lot of time. Just to give you examples, very simple example, just think of a very simple thing like consent management. Consent management is something that is emerging uh, again in line with the emerging week uh, uh, kind of uh, theme because of all the raised concern about you know, privacy and data protection, et cetera. Currently, there are so many different ways of understanding what's consent and how you manage the consent, how you get the citizen to kind of control his own data and being able to give his approval for you know, using his own data, he needs to know who has access to his data and he, he can even revoke this access if, if he or she wants. So consent management is a very, very, very critical small piece that is now needed to be integrated in all government services. Unless you deal with this small piece as a shared service, what will happen that each department will reinvent the wheel and they will try to rethink consent from scratch, particularly that it's an emerging area that is no like one clear cut what's consent and how you, how you manage it. And then you would have huge waste of time, huge duplication, uh, lack of consistency, um, not a street mainstream experience for the citizen where they have to give their consent in a different manners in different, uh, you know, services and maybe services will not have consent at all. But if you have this, small piece as a shared service, as part of your service infrastructure, accessible through APIs, it makes life easy for any new service to reuse this. If you take this and multiply it by 20 or 40 different services, you can imagine that each building block can have huge implication in terms of the impact. So this is part of the challenge that the, the way we are approaching the investment, we are approaching it not by breaking down you know, this big, big thing that we are trying to build into small pieces. And we are trying to create you know, uh, the small pieces that will really enable paperless, cashless, presentless, and consent-based type of services. Identity is another thing, because if you don't have a way to identify people, then you will not have the opportunity to give the people the services that are entitled to. And you cannot deal with this issue of identity several times. Same for registration. Registration, huge. All governments need to run some sort of a registration service. And what they are doing now, if you are registering a vehicle or you are registering uh, a, kind of a, a kind of a vessel or you are registering a farm or a farmer, you are completely duplicating. So the whole idea, how can we think of this registration as a very abstract and generic service that can serve all those types of services of that has to do somehow with registration with some sort of an approval workflow etc in a way so this part of the current challenges in building digital government service it's easy to build one or two or five services but it's very difficult to build 500 and to scale them and more even more critical to maintain them and being able to update them etc so the challenge or, or part of the, this kind of you know, fragmentation and duplication that prevent us providing a kind of a seamless end-to-end -end experience for the citizen and really think of the citizen as one citizen, one government. You know, um, that I am the same citizen, I don't need to put my data and the data needs to flow on the back end and then I need to get a service as if it is one, one government. The, the, one of the challenges that now citizens are very much used to receive this types of value added services in the online uh, you know, environment. You know, now you can do a lot of things online and you kind of having more and more raised expectation that governments also needs to be that responsive and you know, provide the digital government services uh, in the same you know, manner, uh, which I said can, can really have huge implication in terms of improving quality of life, but also uh, cost saving, uh, combating corruption um, and, and all of uh, those kinds of things. So it's, um, you know, it's this um, kind of uh, uncoordinated type of investments um, 
that makes it very difficult for governments also to mainstream digital into the whole economy because of you know that uh, the, the difficulty to manage and also the level of investment that we'll need without having you know those types of approaches so this is this is very um, it becomes uh, you know even for government who have already digitized a number of services they still have you know huge uh, number of services that still needs to be uh, digitized and then even the services that are digitized today they are not necessarily you know uh, digitized end to end what you can see in many countries that in some cases you just have like an online form that you can download and and you can fill it manually it's it's not it's not this is not like a full digitalization of services or that you have to you know um, you know uh, do part of the service online and then the rest of the service um, uh, physically where you have to go again yourself so it's not really getting the full impact or the full value proposition that digitalization can bring and and now uh, i think that the um, the the, the Governments have done their strategies. In many, many cases, we see that there are digital transformation strategies, there are digital government strategies already formulated and developed. But one of the challenges is to say, how can I implement these types of strategies in a way that is cost efficient and that it doesn't create a mess later on? Um, and how can I uh, also um, you know, uh, uh, govern my uh, you know digital government investments and digital government services so this is part of you know the challenges that currently are facing i think the challenge is not anymore about raising awareness or you or you know understanding the importance or, or critical need for you know those type of things i think it's more in implementing and putting in place those types of services and scale them up uh, because what happens <coughs> so far is uh, of having this, um, you know, um, uh, uh, inability and also um, also um, a lack of understanding of uh, how, how I can govern, uh, you know, uh, you know, these types of uh, investments in a way that I can enable reuse across different agencies. We still, one of the uh, challenges actually is in the governance as well, because you see that while there are some, in some cases, central CIOs in governments, those CIOs don't have necessarily enough mandate or enough capability to coordinate the work with the other ministry CIOs. So there is still some improvements or some challenges that needs to be tackled within the governance of, uh, you know, digital governments in uh, in in the uh, in the government space. Uh, CIO, of course, is the chief information officer. Uh, in some even countries, there is no chief architect, for example. Uh, th this position even doesn't exist. Um, there is no uh, central unit that is managing you know, the standardization. How can you agree on similar APIs that uh, everyone should use, for example, to kind of enable interoperability? If you don't have those types of you know, mechanisms in country, then you will never be able to put in place, you know, those types of architectural and those types of, you know, infrastructure, etc. So, I think it's also about having the right, um, uh, you know, uh, coordinating agencies who have the right mandate, but also have the right skills and capacity to be able to, you know, enable this whole of government approach, um, which is, uh, of course, is not very easy to do. But, um, but as we try to explain, to scale up. Uh, you cannot avoid of having, you know, it's not a luxury, it's not an optional anymore. You need to really think how can you rationalize your investment and, and create these types of shared uh, service infrastructure. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tani. It's a great overview in terms of some common challenges that uh, countries face. Maybe in enlightening the audience here, um, we have Estonia representing, you know, advanced digital governance. Just so they might have moved forward in terms of resolving some of these challenges. So, Martin, if you have any intervention or can shed some light on how maybe a particular challenge you faced in Estonia in an early stage of transforming digital government and how the the you know the the country itself move past. 
uh, a particular barrier issue. So uh, thank you, Sherman. Uh, I think the early days of building a digital society in Estonia were very much different from those countries that uh, might uh, start the journey now, because this was the end of 90s, beginning of 2000s. And for example, in Estonia, uh, making the digital identity happen, making secure data exchange actually work. Um, actually, these were not mainstream questions at that time. But uh, one of those examples that I would like to uh, bring out is, for example, uh, two, three years ago, we started actually um, testing uh, the, the, this uh, microservice-based architecture. And one of the uh, services we did, at the, the, one of the first ones, was in Estonia, when you uh, uh, become a father or a mother, you can have one and a half years full salary uh, maternity or paternity leave. And in order for uh, um, usually newborn uh, uh, mothers of newborn kids to get it, uh, before that, uh, this particular service uh, basically needed uh, filling out different forms in different pages. But now, uh, with this microservice architecture, because, well, anyway, the government already knows that you've just given birth. And basically, you log into one site uh, for once, just confirm to whose bank account the money should go. And, and basically, it's a one-time thing, and, and you get this whole one and a half years of uh, maternity leave really easily. But the key here is that this process is not fully automatized. All of the routines not yet have been automatized. But what the microservice architecture actually provides us is that we can automate all the different routines and different pro processes also in a later phase. So, for example, if one of those processes currently seems still complicated, leave it analog. Uh, do other things before. So we can have this gradual growth uh, because the architecture by itself allows it. And another good example from uh, Estonia that is, uh, just went live, I think, uh, three, four months ago, uh, is that we are building a digital 3D twin of our... I believe we might have lost you, Martin. Can you hear us? Apparently has a Teams call or something. Let me reconnect him. Martin, are you with us now? So we'll come back to maybe this Jonian insider experience in, in a moment once he's reconnected, but maybe moving on, uh, given that you know other countries are looking or are along this journey of digital government transformation now, and us as a partnership looking into broadening the impact and acceleration of other people, uh, other countries' progress, um, maybe calling on the speakers here, what, you know, priority countries or regions, what kind of impact with uh, a model approach around whole, whole government um, uh, strategy or model uh, would have and what was the rationalization behind it? Maybe with um, Sarah, you can help start, up off, start, start us off in terms of you know, where GIZ is focusing on uh, on this and, and why there is a realization of, uh, of, of this model within that's impactful. Sure, sure Martin, I think I think Martin is, is back maybe. Yeah, just to, if you wanted to allow the, to close on the previous question. Sure. Sure, Martin. So yeah, sorry, there is some connections. I'm in a super remote place in, in, in Hiuma. Uh, uh, in, an, in an island on a, on a holiday. But yeah, basically the, the whole goal is that 
uh, in Estonia, uh, we have set uh, our own agenda so that our goal is to automate 90% uh, of the routine bureaucracy within the next 10 years. And this type of examples like the 3D twin and, and the maternity leave uh, salary uh, are very good uh, case studies uh, for our country to know that uh, we can build uh, technology in this new kind of way, which will help us to become more adaptive as organizations. I think we lost Martin again. Okay. Maybe let's let's do move on then, because in the interest of time, we are a little bit behind. So, Martin, meanwhile, you're trying to reconnect uh, and and maybe find the nearest, you know, connectivity tower, so on in the middle of an island. Uh, Sarah, maybe moving on then to the question earlier that I posted around where GIZ or where we you probably see this model or, or this kind of approach being most impactful in terms of other countries seeking to uh, be on this journey of digital transformation. Yeah, maybe before we start looking into countries or regions that we want to implement, I think it's also important to emphasize again that I think the charm also lies a little bit in um, uh, the sense that we are trying to create with the Gustec a global solution, right? And a global approach and basically um, provide a bit, an approach um, that can be used, I guess, in Berlin as much as in Kigali. And um, I think that is also from a German perspective, very interesting because let's be honest, Germany is also not at the forefront per se when it comes to the digitization of government services. So I think it's really, um, really a global approach that we're looking at here and one that we as well can still learn a lot from. And I think when we look a little bit on where can, um, can we look on uh, the GovStack initiative and digital building blocks or ICT building blocks to be implemented, it's of course also very important to ensure that we leave no one behind that the digital infrastructure that we're talking about here needs to be equitably accessible for all in the end. And um, I think the situation that we're currently facing is that access to digital solutions is still often limited through copyright regimes and proprietary systems. And I think um, when we look at the development of these building blocks at the moment, it's also crucial, of course, to ensure that that the solutions provided to also work in, in low resource settings in the end. And that, and I think that's the important point that open source um, solutions and scalable solutions can then play a major role in making government services more accessible in the end. And um, I think one of the biggest chances, of course, that these um, digital public goods hold is that they allow countries to yeah, cost efficiently build their digital public infrastructure, what has been said already, to avoid that large sums are spent in development and testing solutions, but actually um, that can make use of blueprints, of best practices um, to develop your own um, digital government applications that are also localized to the local needs in the end. And when it comes to implementation, and I think that was also what you, um, Sherman, were hinting at a little bit more on like what regions are we going to be active in right away, because um, I think this is also from a German development agency perspective, the, the point where we can really contribute is when it comes to, to capacity building, to, um, to technical assistance, um, and to basically, um, yeah, closing also a little bit knowledge and capacity gaps in that sense. Um, we are at the moment looking at three core partners that, we, that we're going to work with. Um, first, uh, through our co cooperation with the Smart Africa, with Smart Africa, which um, is for us also a very important strategic partnership that helps us to link to local partners, but also, um, yeah, to promote the harmonization of standards for the most important ICT building blocks and advance um, yeah, applicability let, in the end. Um, second, we are also working closely with the BMZ Digital Centers um, 
for example, um, also in Rwanda and Kenya, the digital centers there hold a close contact to the local ICT ministries and the local digital ecosystems as well, and thereby provide us with a, with a great framework for capacity building and technical assistance in the countries when it comes to um, e-government solutions and the development of them, and of course, yeah, the, the capacity building mechanisms um, surrounding them. And last but not least, under the Horn of Africa initiative, we brought together over 100 key representatives um, from the governments of Djibouti, Eritrea, Ethiopia, Kenya, Somalia, and uh, Sudan as partner countries, and um, really try to develop their regional approach to again ensure that um, yeah, it can be benefited from best practices and um, um, we can ensure a, a maximized return turn of investment there as well. And I think what will be especially helpful for us when it comes to also more the implementation part of this um, initiative is the sandbox environment, the reference platform that is to be built, which um, creates a great framework for governments to try out a little bit, to make it a little bit more haptic, what we're dealing with here, to basically build their own use cases, because in the end, it's of course really about making it work for the very specific context and not blueprints that can be used um, identically in all settings in the end. And maybe just a little side note there, um, we are currently in the process of um, yeah, of building this platform or on the procurement process as well. And we're having a request for interest out there and RFI out there um, where we're looking also a little bit for what the market looks like um, to get an idea of what system integrators might be um, able and willing to um, to build that platform. Um, I'm going to happily share this link also later on, but there we're also looking for um, interested parties, of course. And I think maybe one last um, uh, note when it comes to the whole implementing part, um, I guess we're well aware that in a lot of cases, um, digital government solutions or services are already in place and that we're not um, starting here from a green playing field. Mm. But what we witness often when it comes to di digitalization of government services and um, what we often see, and as I said, Germany is definitely not an exception when it comes to that, that it is still very much often operated in silos. And um, I think this is where we still can make a good contribution with the GovStack initiative to break up the silos a little bit to follow a whole of government approach and make sure that um, the investments now are spent in a multi-purpose um, and cross-sector digital solutions. And um, yeah. That's uh, all for now, I would say. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I think one specific point you alluded to that maybe we'll call on to reflection from, from the panel here again is when we talk about digital transformation or digital government services enablement by the partnerships that were presented here, this, this model itself is not solely you know, the solution itself, it cannot be implemented in isolation of other enabling factors in terms of the overall strategy required by member states, by country governments to really provide holistic citizen service centric services in a digital mean. So uh, maybe questions to the overall panel here, what are other enabling components or a uh, enabling environment looks like in order for successful digital governance, especially in the context of the country audience that we have here, um, maybe drawing on insights and experience and learnings that you've seen on what other um, uh, you know, elements needs to be in place in, in institutionally or in principles so that um, a more whole of government approach can actually be realized. So anybody would like to provide an intervention on this? Maybe <clears throat> let me kick off uh, just to, I, I think we have already mentioned few of them because indeed, I mean, we all know that it's not only about technology, it's about so many other things. It's about the, you know, the people capacity, 
You, you need to have smart workforce for a smart government. You cannot just have a smart government. You need the workforce itself needs to be ready, you know, to adopt and 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 use and also create those types of services. But I would like maybe from at least the IT perspective, really uh, remind us all again for the connectivity issues because. Um, you know, particularly in, uh, you know, LDCs and the SIDS, et cetera, I think the connectivity might be still an issue, particularly in some uh, geographical areas where uh, you don't have necessarily a full access to broadband. Um, and I think um, the, the, the approach that we are trying to take in the GAF stack is really to think, how can we enable uh, all the government services different uh, across different channels? I mean, uh, you know, it, it's not only about, you know, being able, being available online, but I think that you need to make, you know, some of the services also available, whether through the normal mobile channels, like, you know, USSD type of and SMS type of approach, even IVRs and, and the things like that. But also think of, uh, you know, enabling those types of government services already on the tools or through the tools that people are already using. So this can cater a little bit to the issue of digital literacy because uh, we we still see that there is, uh, you know, still um, a kind of a gap in terms of uh, you know citizens' capacity to to use those types of services and um, and uh, we all know that uh, you know social media now is 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 uh, is one of the tools that is being uptake uptaken by uh, by a lot of people and it's important that we leverage those types of channels. To make sure that um, you know that anyone can access um, you know the government services, you know the use of chatbots, for example. I think all government services should be or could be uh, available uh, through those types of you know uh, chatbots. Particularly if those chatbots are also uh, AI enabled, where you know people can use natural language processing and 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 um, you know even sometimes. Uh, their voice, uh, etc., to be able to find the types of service instead of them being, you know, have to browse um, hundreds of services until they find what they need. I think the government needs to um, think of how to make those accessible, even in uh, in areas of infrastructure that is still not developed, and also to cater to digital literacy issues. So those are two examples of other enabling uh, elements that will have huge impact on the uptake. It's not enough to have a service available. The most important that people use it because we saw that in some countries, services are available online, but people are not really using it, at least at, uh, at large scale. So I think, um, you know, having this kind of thinking in terms of all the other, uh, you know, enabling environment factors and really try to address them um, uh, is, is, is key. There are, of course, other things, but maybe others will try to uh, touch base on them as well. Thank you, Hani. I can maybe chip in. I'm not sure if Martin um, is back with us, but I think I just want to underline one thing that he also mentioned earlier. I think it's often also really about um, not only um, a change of infrastructure or provision of a technology infrastructure, but also really about a change of mindset when it comes to digitization. And it's just very important to take that steps to see uh, clearly, I guess, the chances, but also the risks, of course, that some uh, some infrastructures hold, um, yeah, but uh, also to, to overcome a skepticism that often comes with um, the use of new technology. And in the end, of course, I think one of the key aspects is to really focus on citizen-centric um, solutions and on the key and focusing firstly on really understanding the, the key challenges and the citizen challenges that, um, that are faced when it comes to um, the access of government services. I hope I'm uh, heard. Can somebody confirm? I can comment as well. Confirm. Yes. Uh, so uh, basically one of the components that is uh, uh, really obligatory to develop it is the actual practice of it. So meaning that actually the first use cases that can be deployed, these can be fairly simple and easy. But uh, what is critical about that is that we need to celebrate this practice. 
uh, when there is a good success story, even if it's a small digital service, then we need to celebrate and uh, talk about it as well. But why is this important is that, for example, in Estonia, we, we have this uh, way of getting the society in, in digital transformation on this positive feedback cycle. It's, uh, it's kind of the way that every once in a while, I don't know, once a year, twice a year, there is some sort of a new digital service and the society uh, finds it useful and it's, it's practical. But you need to keep this, uh, uh, these uh, uh, positive experiences on a regular basis. But this also builds the technical and the community of domain experts around the different services. So it's, it's e important to celebrate the practice and also to start small. It's not important to start with the most difficult and biggest services. It, it can be done in a very, very subtle and easy way, and then start with the more difficult ones. Thank you. Great reflection, Martin. And certainly, as I mentioned, you know, Estonia is a great example of seeing how digital governments had actually really advance. Uh, I think some other, you know, uh, complementary components or elements in the en enabling environment is the setup of good holistic policies and regulations uh, in place, and of course, the underlying infrastructure as well. And, uh, you know, learning from a unique model or other digital governance settings where there is vibrant connections between private and public sectors and make these services fully available and digitalized. It's also um, something we've, 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 we were observing and we're looking to see how we can broaden that uh, learning and experience into, into um, countries that are looking into establishing a similar structure or, or model as such. Um, I think in the interest of time, we will probably move on to um, wrapping up, but also opening up the floor to the audience here, if there are any questions to our panel here. Um, so maybe over to ITU in, as a technical monitoring agency to, to, to help us funnel through questions. Maybe, uh, uh... Uh, Sherman, I see a question actually from uh, uh, from the floor from uh, Ashim Malik, who I uh, send my regards. By the way, uh, we worked uh, oui. with Ashim. Bonjour à tous. Je me connecte depuis le Sénégal. Oui, bonjour Alors. Ashim. Allez-y. Oui, donc euh, je j'ai déjà même écrit sur le chat. Euh, donc, euh, de prendre en compte, et eh bien, merci d'abord de l'initiative et de la qualité de, du discours euh, des, venant de, de, des experts, des différents experts qui ont euh, exposé. Seulement, je voulais attirer l'attention euh, des, des consultants et des experts sur un phénomène qui nous rattrape peut-être avec la COVID-19, mais aussi qui est essentiel aujourd'hui dans le développement de nos, de nos pays et de nos économies c'est les aspects e-commerce. Donc, nous avons de part et d'autre des pays de l'Afrique développé des stratégies sur le e-commerce, mais ceci inscrit dans le cadre de la zone de libre-échange économique qui fait 1,2 milliard d'habitants. Donc, c'est un marché commun colossal de par sa taille, mais aussi de par ses exigences, parce qu'aujourd'hui, je crois que la technologie a trouvé, vraiment, a, en fait, a trouvé la solution idéale pour le développement euh, fulgurant donc des échanges commerciaux en Afrique, ce qui fait qu'aujourd'hui nous devons prendre en compte et sérieusement en compte cet aspect donc de développement du e-commerce et euh, ensuite par ricochet prendre en compte les modes de paiement, l'interopérabilité, l'inclusion financière numérique qui sont des aspects de développement très essentiels sur lesquels l'UT doit avoir un accent particulier aujourd'hui sur euh, je veux dire cette, ce problème d'acuité. Ça, je salue en passant Hani qui, a, qui fait un travail extraordinaire avec nous, qui l'a fait avec la santé. Aujourd'hui, je suis heureux de le revoir donc, sur d'autres problématiques qui sont liées au développement de l'Afrique. Merci beaucoup. 
Merci Hachim. Peut-être je peux euh, fournir quelques éléments de réponse et euh, je, je salue d'ailleurs Hachim. Je crois qu'on a travaillé ensemble au Sénégal euh, pour euh, beaucoup d'autres problématiques et peut-être euh, cette initiative en fait répond en quelque sorte à quelques défis qu'on a rencontrés euh, lors des, des, premières, des premiers projets qu'on a essayé de faire ensemble. Euh, certainement, on est tous d'accord en fait, sur le fait que le commerce électronique euh, devient de plus en plus euh, important, euh, surtout avec la fermeture des marchés en fait, lors du Covid et euh, la nécessité en fait, de passer immédiatement euh, pour le commerce électronique. Et d'ailleurs, dans le contexte du projet GAFSTEC, en fait, on prend en compte en fait, ce qu'on appelle les building blocks. Il y a euh, effectivement un module euh, sur euh, les plateformes e-commerce et comment ça s'intègre en fait, avec les autres modules euh, en ce qui concerne, par exemple, les paiements électroniques et l'identité numérique aussi. Euh, et aussi tout l'aspect la, 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 sécurité, euh, etc., et bien sûr, euh, le commerce électronique est, est lié à beaucoup plus d'autres euh, éléments aussi. Euh, il ne suffit pas d'avoir une plateforme euh, pour euh, vraiment mettre en place la, le commerce électronique. Il faut avoir aussi avoir toute la chaîne euh, d'approvisionnement, tous les, 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 les transports. Euh, il y a beaucoup d'éléments en fait, euh, qui sont nécessaires. Euh, aussi, il faut euh, y réfléchir par rapport à, aux aspects réglementaires qui, qui sont liés en fait, à, au commerce, surtout si le commerce aussi concerne euh, euh, entre pays. En fait. Donc, ces aspects-là euh, seront euh, entre guillemets étudiés, mais aussi inclus dans le travail qu'on est en train de faire pour établir, pour aider les gouvernements en fait, d'établir ce genre de, de plateforme, ce genre de solution qui seront disponibles pour, euh, qui, qui doivent être disponibles en fait pour tous les secteurs concernés qui, qui ont besoin d'avoir ce genre de, de plateforme et de solution. Et, euh, et, euh, et je crois qu'on on, on travaille aussi en close collaboration, en collaboration étroite avec euh, les agences des Nations Unies en fait qui gèrent, euh, qui sont spécialisées dans le commerce comme le UNCTAD euh, ou le ITC, International Trade Center qui font aussi partie de ce groupe élargi de, de partenaires avec qui nous travaillons. Euh, donc, euh, effectivement, j'espère que ça va répondre à vos préoccupations. Et, et encore une fois, je vous envoie mes meilleures salutations et c'est très bien de, de vous voir encore une fois, Chim. Merci pour la question pour le Sénégal. Senegal. Uh, delegates. I believe there's a question from the Kuwait delegate. Ms. Uh, Samir from Kuwait, the floor is yours. Sabah al khair. ومساء الخير للجميع أود أن أشكركم في البداية على هذا الحدث المهم جدا بالنسبة لنا جميعا كدول الأعضاء بالاتحاد وخارج الاتحاد أيضا نحن نعلم أن التقنيات الحديثة والتحول الرغمي من أهم المواضيع التي مطروحة على ساحة الاتصالات بالوقت الحالي لكن لدي سؤال بسيط جدا أنا لاحظت أن الموقع لا يشمل على الترجمة العربية هذا سؤالي كان وقد وضحت في الشات لماذا لا توجد ترجمة للعربية لهذا الحدث جميع اللغات موجودة ما عدا العربية نحن مهتمون بهذا الموضوع وفي الاجتماع الأخير لفريق العمل اللجنة الاستشارية المعنية بالقرارات والديكلاريشن والإعلان والأولويات المواضيعية طالبنا كمجموعة عربية بأن يتم الانتباه إلى موضوع التقنيات الحديثة في الديكلاريشن في الإعلان فأرجو أن يتم حل هذا الموضوع لتتمكن المنطقة العربية بالاستفادة الكاملة من هذا الحدث شكرا شكرا لمندوبة الكويت أعتقد أن حضرتك تقصدين الترجمة الخاصة ب 
الموقع الخاص بالايفنت او بالحدث نفسه اللي هو الايمرجنج تكنولوجي وفي هذه الحاله اود ارجاء الموضوع الى القائمين على تنظيم هذا الحدث ومراعاه اخذ في الاعتبار الطلب الموجه من مندوبه الكويت شكرا I do hope that the, the translation or interpretation can be resolved for the rest of the week. Is there any questions, any other questions from the audience? I believe there's a full comment from Senegal. Non, plutôt, j'ai écrit sur le chat. Merci. J'ai écrit sur le chat. Thank you. Much appreciated. I think there was an earlier question before. Uh, I'm not sure from which country it is, but Ms. Rosario Galvin commented or, question, or raised the question about how interoperability would work for crisis management in national disasters or others. And by building blocks on top of core administrative layers, how feasible would it be to stitch and deploy blocks on demand to serve decision makers on the ground under critical conditions when there is an urgency and every minute matters? Um, is there any reflection from, from the panel in terms of how you know uh, responsive and agile deployment of services from a country's perspective to manage crises, particularly in the context and the light of the pandemic recently. Um, uh, what had, what had, you know, what, what could be learned from an experience like this? Maybe I can provide some elements there, but also others can uh, chime in. Um, I think the whole concept of uh, powering governments with the right, you know, service infrastructure is is key. Particularly that if you have these types of infrastructure, it becomes very quick and very uh, responsive to deploy new services, particularly in cases of emergencies. And and not only for emergencies, obviously, but also in terms of uh, emergencies. However, establishing these types of infrastructure takes time. It's a, it's a significant investment, and, and I don't think that we can do this quickly. <clears throat> it takes years to establish these types of infrastructure. But once the infrastructure is there, then adding new services, creating you know, um, some sort of alerts or, or some sort of uh, you know, um, campaigns for citizens to inform them about uh, you know, a disaster or you know, having your GIS uh, kind of uh, infrastructure in place that you can use also for natural disasters. This is exactly the type of, of, uh, of readiness that we <clears throat> would like to have governments um, powered by having, you know, uh, and be ready to deploy services in, in a very short period of time and with little investments as well. Uh, however, establishing the infrastructure itself is, is extremely is something that will uh, is costly and it will take time. Uh, however, if you have this in, uh, you know, infrastructure, it's also easy to uh, launch services that are also interoperable because they are based on a foundation that is interoperable and can enable interoperability. So I think this is maybe one additional reason why governments need to uh, consider invest investing in having you know, those kind of building blocks that are standing and ready to, uh, to be used and consumed uh, depending on the need. Yeah, maybe to just on what uh, what Hani just said, I think as well, it's not that um, the building blocks provide a super agile measure to um, directly adjust uh, government services, but I think um, situations as the global pandemic also over the last year show quite intensely in what um, sectors and areas. Um, good uh, government services and accessible government services can help in providing um, education and 
as well as in you know making social welfare payments maybe etc cetera, etc cetera. so i think it also just per to portrait again um that also for crisis preparedness it is essential to um have good digital government services in place and if um this is happening it makes things easier in moments of crisis as well thank you sarah I believe with that, uh, we are coming to a close. And thank you very much for our panel today, uh, engaging with the delegations here, talking about scalability and e-government services. Uh, reflecting on Sarah's earlier comment and leaving no one behind, if there's one message that I could leave with the audience today, it's what really resonated uh, with me uh, recently in the Mobile World Congress, Ms. Uh, Doreen Bagdan Martin, the director of the Digital Development Bureau at ITU, spoke about leaving no one behind, meaning leaving no one offline. So in the context of that, as we're thinking about deploying digital government services, uh, alluding to Hani's point, we would really like to make sure that countries continue to seek effort to broaden coverage and create more equitable access for all of your populations in terms of uh, engaging government services in that regard. So on that note, um, thank you very much for coming today and enjoy the rest of the emergent week. Back to ITU. So thank you very much uh, for this great session. Um, uh, also, thank you very much to all our panelists uh, for, for running this session, as well as to the captioners and all interpreters. Uh, I'm calling for our facilitator of the whole uh, event uh, to take over and uh, now to lead us towards the next building blocks uh, of the event. So I don't know if uh, Aminata is uh, ready with us. Um, I, and this is open call. I don't see, um, but if she's not with us, uh, she will be just soon in the following session. Uh, so ladies and gentlemen and uh, all colleagues uh, on behalf of all organizers of this session and the GovStack, we would like to thank you very much for being with us. And we see at the uh, next uh, session uh, and the opening uh, ceremony of uh, the uh, event. So thank you very much and uh, see you uh, soon. Thank you. Thank the you. session is thank closed. You. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Yeah.